I'm Megan Lee, and I'm going to be reading you Frendel by Andrew Clemens, starting with Chapter 1, Nick. If you ask the kids and the teachers at Lincoln Elementary School to make three lists, all the really bad kids, all the really smart kids, and all the really good kids, Nick Allen would not be on any of them. Nick deserved a list of his own, and everyone knew it. Was Nick a troublemaker? Hard to say. One thing's for sure, Nick Allen had plenty of ideas, and he knew what to do with them. One time in third grade, Nick decided to turn Miss Denver's room into a tropical island. What kid in New Hampshire isn't ready for a little summer in February? So first, he got everyone to make small palm trees out of green and brown construction paper and tape them onto the corners of each desk. Miss Denver had only been a teacher for about six months, and she was delighted. That's so cute. The next day, all the girls wore paper flowers in their hair, and all the boys wore sunglasses and beach hats. Miss Denver clapped her hands and said, it's so colorful. The day after that, Nick turned the classroom thermostat up to about 90 degrees with a little screwdriver he had brought from home. All the kids changed into shorts and t-shirts with no shoes. And when Miss Denver left the room for a minute, Nick spread about 10 cups of fine white sand all over the classroom floor. Miss Denver was surprised again at just how creative her students could be. But the sand got tracked out into the hallways where Manny the custodian did not think it was creative at all and he stomped right down to the office. The principal followed the trail of sand and when she arrived, Miss Denver was teaching the hula to some kids near the front of the room. And a tall, thin, shirtless boy with chestnut hair was just spiking a Nerf volleyball over a net made from six t-shirts tied together. The third grade trip to the South Seas ended suddenly, but that didn't stop Nick from trying to liven things up. Lincoln Elementary needed a good jolt once in a while, and Nick was just the guy to deliver it. About a year later, Nick made the great blackbird discovery. One night he learned on a TV show that red-winged blackbirds give this high-pitched chirp when a hawk or some other danger comes near. Because of the way sound travels, the hunter birds can't tell where the high-pitched chirp is coming from. The next day, during silent reading, Nick glanced over at his teacher and he noticed that Miss Avery's nose was curved, kind of like the beak of a hawk. So Nick let out a high-pitched, squeaky blackbird peep. Miss Avery jerked her head up from her book and looked around. She couldn't tell who did it, so she just said shh to the whole class. A minute later, Nick did it again, louder, peep. This time, there was a little giggling from the class, but Miss Avery pretended not to hear the sound, and about 15 seconds later, she slowly stood up and walked to the back of the classroom without taking her eyes off his book and without moving at all. Nick put his heart and soul into the highest and most annoying chirp of all. Peep, Miss Avery pronounced. Janet Fisk, you stop that this instant. Janet, who was sitting four rows away from Nick, prominently turned white, then bright crimson. But it wasn't me, honest. There was a catch in Janice's voice, as if she might cry. Miss Avery knew she had made a mistake, and she apologized to Janet. But someone is asking for big trouble said Miss Avery, looking like more like a hawk every second. Nick kept reading, and he didn't make a peep. At, lunch at lunchtime, Nick talked to Janet. He felt bad that Miss Avery had pronounced, er, pounced on her. Janet lived in Nick's neighborhood, and sometimes they played together. She was good at baseball, and she was better at soccer than most of the kids in the whole school, boys or girls. Nick said, hey Janet, I'm sorry you got yelled at during reading. It was my fault. I was the one who made that sound. You did, said Janet, but how come Miss Avery thought it was me? So Nick told her about the blackbirds and Janet thought it was pretty interesting. Then she tried making a peep or two and just Janet's chirps were even higher and squeakier than Nick's. She promised to keep everything a secret for the rest of Nick's fourth grade year, at least once a week. Miss Avery heard a loud peep from somewhere in her classroom. Sometimes it was a high-pitched chirp, and sometimes it was a very high-pitched chirp. Miss Avery never figured out who was making that sound, and gradually she trained herself to ignore it. But she still looked like a hawk. To Nick, 
The whole thing was just one long and successful science experiment, and Janet Fisk enjoyed it too. Chapter 2, Miss Granger. Fifth grade was different. That was the year to get ready for middle school. Fifth grade meant passing classes, it meant no morning recess, it meant real letter grades on your report cards, but most of all, it meant Miss Granger. There were about 150 kids in fifth grade, and there were seven fifth grade teachers, two math, two science, two social studies, but only one language arts teacher. In language arts, Miss Granger had a monopoly and a reputation. Miss Granger lived alone in a tidy little house in the older part of town. She drove an old pale blue car to school every morning, rain or shine, snow or sleet, hail or wind. She had a perfect attendance record that stretched back farther than anyone could remember. Her hair was almost white, swept away from her face and up into something like a nest on the back of her head. Unlike some of the younger women teachers, she never wore pants to school. She only had two skirt and jacket outfits, her gray uniform and her blue uniform, which she always wore over a white shirt with a little cameo pin at the neck. And Miss Granger was one of those people who never wore sweats. It had to be over 90 degrees before she would even take off her jacket. She was small, as teachers go. There were even some fifth graders who were taller, but Miss Granger seemed like a giant. It was her eyes that did it. They were dark gray, and if she turned them on full power, they could make you feel like a speck of dust. Her eyes could twinkle and laugh too, and kids said she could crack really funny jokes, but it wasn't the jokes that made her famous. Everyone was sure that Miss Granger had x-ray vision. Don't even think about chewing a piece of gum within 50 feet of her. If you did, Miss Granger would see you and catch you and make you stick the gum onto a bright yellow index card. Then she would safety pin the card to the front of your shirt and you'd have to wear it for the rest of the school day. After that, you had to take it home and have your mom or dad sign the card and bring it back to Miss Granger the next day. And it didn't matter to Miss Granger if you weren't in fifth grade, because the way she saw it, sooner or later, you would be. All the kids at Lincoln Elementary School knew that by the end of the line, fifth grade, Miss Granger would be the one grading their spelling test and their test, the worst of all, their vocabulary test, week after week, month after month. Every language arts teacher in the world enjoys making kids use the dictionary. Check your spelling, check that definition, check those syllable breaks. But Miss Granger didn't just enjoy the dictionary. She loved the dictionary, almost worshiped it. Her weekly vocabulary list was 35 words long, sometimes longer. As if that wasn't bad enough, there was a word of the day on the blackboard every morning. If you gave yourself a day off and didn't write the one word down and look it up and learn the definition sooner or later, Miss Granger would find out. And then just for you, there would be two words for the day for a whole week. Miss Granger kept a full set of 30 dictionaries on a shelf at the back of the room. But her pride and joy was one of those huge dictionaries with every word in the universe in it, the kind of book it takes two kids to carry. It sat on its own little table at the front of her classroom sort of like the altar at the front of a church. Every graduate of Lincoln Elementary School for the past 35 years could remember standing at that table, listening to Miss Granger's battle cry. Look it up. That's why we have the dictionary. Even before the school year started, when it was still the summer before fifth grade, for Nick and his friends, Miss Granger was already busy. Every parent of every new fifth grader got a letter from her. Nick's mom read aloud, during dinner one night in August. Every home is expected to have a good dictionary in it so that, they, that, so that each student can do his or her homework properly. Good spelling and good grammar and good word skills are essential for every student. Clear thinking requires a command for the English language. And fifth grade is the ideal time for every girl and boy to acquire an expanded vocabulary. And then there was a list of the dictionaries that Ms. Granger thought would be acceptable for study home. Miss Allen said, it's so nice to have a teacher who takes her work so seriously. Nick groaned and tried to enjoy the rest of his hamburger, but even watermelon for dessert didn't cheer him up. 
Nick had no particular use for the dictionary. He liked words a lot, and he was good at using them, but he figured that he got all the words he needed just by reading, and he read all the time. When Nick ran into a word he didn't know, he asked his brother or his dad, or whoever was handy, what it meant. And if they knew, they'd tell him, but not Miss Granger. She had heard all about her. He had heard all about her, and he had seen fifth graders in the library last year, noses stuck in their dictionaries, frantically trying to finish their vocabulary sheets before English class. It was still a week before school, and Nick already felt like fifth grade was going to be a very long year. Thank you.